Dwight, and thank you all for coming in in the middle of the, what I know is a kind of insane time for all of us. I was just talking about how I just feel uh, completely distracted most of the time, but um, I'm really happy to focus on this uh, presentation with you um, this this hour, and it's all kind of new ideas to me, and it was inspired this summer by the protests and by the murder of George Floyd and the persistence of the protests, but also by my um, learning about the Tulsa massacre for the first time. And I was both puzzled and astounded and horrified that I was learning about that for the first time. So I read as much as I could about it this summer and started thinking about white violence and uh, thinking about how to place that at the center of our curricular pedagogic and uh, research agendas uh, in order to really start thinking about our history uh, in a radically different way than we have. So this is just a, a start on that, and I'm going to share my screen and work through these PowerPoint slides with you that I developed, and, and they are sort of bullet pointed, but uh, because I always use way too many words, um, they are the, probably the, some of the wordiest PowerPoint slides you'll ever see. Um, but I hope that they will communicate to you the gist of an, a developing argument in my uh, research. So, um, and also, I just want to give you a step after what Dwight said is that Max Faber is in the title and he's definitely in the presentation. But funnily enough, so far, he's the only one I don't directly cite. He's like haunting presentation all the time and all of my thoughts, but I haven't really figured it out yet and developed a way of integrating uh, his work and theory of rationalization into the into the presentation yet so i just wanted to give you that heads up but you'll hear max he's there for sure uh, so some preliminary remarks the presentation focuses on whiteness and tries to understand the virulence of white violence against black communities and individuals since the civil war uh, these little asterisks just refer to supplemental notes but i think i probably won't use them very much because uh or i'll see how much i need to fill in later uh, I bring to bear various theoretical resources to think about white supremacy as it is defended and perpetuated through deployments of reactive and defensive violence that work in a complex relationship to the mechanisms of the modern state apparatus. I focus attention on the Tulsa massacre of 1921. I do not answer questions like what really happened in the elevator, and that reference will make sense in the presentation, or how many people really died, or did some people, some white people help black people during or after the riot? And yes, they did. Um, I do not disaggregate whiteness to the level of the individual. I want to think about it as a structure, historical force, and a collaborative will to power emergent from the dynamics of shuttle slavery and perpetuated through informal and formal means of organized violence. So that in bold is, is sort of my project here. Just to start, these are some images from the Tulsa massacre. Uh, fires, burning, looting, and uh, murder by, by shooting and sometimes by torture were the means by which the white community in Tulsa on the night of May 31st uh, invaded the black neighborhood called Greenwood. And these are just some images. This is the, the Zion Baptist Church that had literally just been completed weeks before the riot and is one of the points of absolute pride in the Greenwood community. Um, this is an, uh, just a sense of the extent of the damage and the fires. These are uh, white people parading uh, in the streets. Uh, and you'll see that there are also women in the streets of Greenwood parading through after looting and committing violence. And the three bottom photos are the aftermath of uh, people picking through the wreckage of their belongings and businesses. Uh, this photo will, will be explained more later. It's uh, black persons being marched to detention camps. And this is just a general overview shot of the extent of the devastation of this one mile square area that was Greenwood, Tulsa, in Tulsa, neighborhood in Tulsa. So to give some background, uh, Greenwood neighborhood in Tulsa was known as the Black Wall Street. It was about a mile square and had about 15,000 Residents. I think it's really important to note that it was not a finance district. I don't like the appellation Black Wall Street because it implies that there was uh, that there was financialized wealth in that community. There wasn't. It was a business and residential community. It was certainly one of the wealthiest in America among Black communities. It was not a Wall Street, and we need to just remember that because there's a massive wealth gap 
and wealth is very different from the kind of income we get from businesses and residents uh, and uh, and from income. So it's in the north part of Texas. I mean, Tulsa, Texas. Oh, my God. So black lynching activist Ida B. Wells, a little bit more background, among others, told black people to head west in the 18th where they could have some relief from violent white reactions to any sign black people were developing political or economic independence. And given the rapid growth during oil boom, Tulsa, Oklahoma was an attractive option and Greenwood was the result. It was the kind of relatively independent black owned business and residential district black activists and civil rights movement have worked toward. Many black towns in fact sprung up in Oklahoma between 1890 and 1930. So the brief history of the Tulsa white race riot on the morning of May 31st, 1921, a young black man, Dick Rowland, who works as a shoeshine person or boot black, needs to use the bathroom. The only bathroom available to a black person in the white area of Tulsa where he works is at the top floor of the Drexel office building across the street. He must use the elevator. The elevator operator is a white woman named Sarah Page. Upon the door opening on the assigned floor, she's heard yelling. Dick Rowland is seen running from the elevator. She alleges he assaulted her. The actual story is most likely that he tripped leaving the elevator or stepping on her toe, then reached for and maybe grabbed her arm to keep her from falling. Mr. Rowland is arrested the following day and held at the jail, which is on the top floor of the county courthouse. Sarah Page recants charges the day he is arrested. So this was the, the headline in the Tulsa Tribune on May 31st, 1921, a white-owned paper with a Steve Bannon-like editor. The day Mr. Rowland was arrested read, Nab Negro for attacking girl in elevator. And there's an opinion ed piece that was written by the owner of the paper that has been eliminated from all historical archives and no one can find it, but black and white residents in Tulsa say that there is an even more inflammatory uh, uh, op-ed piece calling for, essentially calling for a lynching of Dick Rowland in the same paper. But again, like the rest of the Tulsa riot, that history has literally been erased. The paper was on the streets at about 3.15, the day, uh, the day that Dick Rowland was arrested and brought to the courthouse. And within 45 minutes, talk of lynching began to circulate among whites. The sheriff took reasonable measures to protect disabling the elevator at the top floor and placing additional guards on the top floor where the detention cells were located. Hearing rumors of a possible lynching, black men armed themselves and went to the courthouse to offer help to the sheriff in defending the structure and Rowland. The sheriff told them to go home and they did, even while white mo people were mobilizing and circulating around the courthouse. Black men returned to the courthouse again in response to the massing of armed white men, now upwards of 200. The white men had attempted to steal weapons from an armory and when thwarted, pillaged gun shops. The black men were again encouraged to leave as they were dispersing, heading back to Greenwood. A white man threatened to disarm a black man. A shot was fired. This triggered a response among the white crowd and the attack on the black community began. White crowds stormed into Greenwood, burning and looting and shooting for hours. The black community fought back as best it could. After the violence stopped, Thousands of black citizens were herded into internment camps for their own protection, quote unquote, held for up to 10 days after the night of the riot. And hundreds of white men were deputized after the riot to protect against the black retaliation they were sure would come from the black towns surrounding Tulsa and Oklahoma. Such retaliation never materialized. So these are some points of interest that I wanted to highlight in reviewing the literature about the Tulsa massacre. In order to relieve himself, Dick Rowland had to use an elevator run by a white woman. In the racialized space in which he worked, he was forced by law to put himself at obvious risk to share an enclosed space with a white woman and no witnesses to use the bathroom. Black communities, uh, second point, black communities don't only resist and protest after the fact of white violence, they prepared to fight the lynching of Rowland and they were armed. Historical evidence shows that defensive responses to white threats also are fully warranted. And I have some other stories about lynchings within the last couple of years before Rowland, and these lynchings were not of black men, they were of white men, but the white men were identified as communists. Uh, they were members of the Wobbly Movement or the International Workers of the World. And it was also a, a white itinerant man who was lynched for allegedly shooting a Tulsa cab driver. 
So uh, the black community in Greenwood, when they heard word that Dick Rowland had been um, had been arrested, obviously, if the white community is going to lynch one of their own, they knew from history and from uh, from obvious experience that they would go after Dick Rowland. Individuals identified as white will respond differently in racialized contexts, sometimes depending upon their positioning within the state and or society. And here I did want to uh, mention one of my, refer to one of my supplementary notes on that. Um, because the sheriff was trying to do his job properly. The police chief ignored and enabled the recently arrested white crowd. It's, it's important to disaggregate to some degree the ways in which different fig figures in law enforcement responded. The sheriff was not act necessarily, however, acting in the interest of the black community, but rather, I would argue, trying to sustain the very thin legitimacy of the white state that had emerged out of slavery. This white state has never fully overwritten the effects of shuttle, shuttle slavery, not with amendments to the Constitution or legislative remedies but those initiatives sustain its legitimacy when we talk about progress. So um, after the burning and killing had subsided, thousands of families, black families and individuals were herded in camps because it was assumed by their very presence in the street would trigger more violence, either coming from them as retaliatory or coming from white people to continue the burning and the looting and the racial cleansing that that, was, that, that event in, uh, was about. They were locked up for over a week. Uh, thousands more left town, apparently, and I, I would call this a racial cleansing event. That was the intent, and much of the aftermath shows a continuation of that intent. We can talk about that later. Well, in turn, the directors of the camps forced the black detainees to do work of the camps and paid them using the funds donated, including Red Cross funds, to help Greenwood residents rebuild. No white person was ever detained or charged with criminal violence. Sarah Page recanted her claims the day of the riot, and Dick Rowland survived the catastrophic events triggered by his need to use the bathroom. Ultimately, the community of Greenwood was rebuilt on the grit and resilience of the black community in Tulsa, with minimal aid from any external resources. So my question here was, why is this violence so excessive? What is that about? And given what we know about the interest, what can it tell us about whiteness and about white violence, white supremacy? So given what we know about the interests organized, the interest, I'm sorry, given what we know about the interest that organized white business leaders in Tulsa held in the land on which Greenwood sat, I'm talking about the land, not the buildings and all that, but the actual property that was left once it was burned to the ground. One could assert that they encouraged and took advantage of the reactive and riotous impulse of white Tulsans when word of a threat of a black invasion went around. Does this explain the viciousness of the white violence and the persistence of white fears after having destroyed the economic livelihood and homes of 15,000 citizens? I think there must be more to it than material greed and eliminating competition. Further, the white community relied on black labor. The money spent in Greenwood businesses was earned in white homes and industry across town. When the thousands of black Tulsans left, white people were left with a severe labor shortage. This kind of violence does not in the general or public interest, even if that is defined only for whites. So I'm turning to another way of thinking about white violence. Since its invention during the Atlantic slave trade, blackness has always been suspected of being innately dangerous. This is purely a construction of what I will call here European white master thinking. The fear white people have of black people is grounded in the European white invention of race to explain and rationalize slavery. We should remember that race and racism did not cause slavery. Race was the theory that explained slavery, and racism was the effect of the enslavement of African peoples. In creating the slave out of a human being, European white people thought they had created a monster. Thomas Jefferson famously said, we have the wolf by the ears. We dare not let him go. The renowned commentator on American democracy, Alexis de Tocqueville, also assumed that if liberty be refused to the Negroes of the South, they will, in the end, forcibly seize it for themselves. If it be given, they will long use it. In his critique of colonialism, Franz Fanon says this monster was called native by the Europeans. There never was a wolf. Black dangerousness has always been and remains a figment of the white imagination. 
with very marginal acceptance, any threat of organized black violence against white people in the US has been in self-defense. Further, on racial terms, there has never been an equal playing field with respect to the use of force. So I think about white supremacy as white fear and white resentment. Virulent forms of white violence have been the reaction to every sign of black communal empowerment or autonomy, whether it be black people with guns, with competitive businesses, and perhaps the most threatening of all, with the potential to wield political power with a vote. White violence in the United States is grounded in fear and resentment. It is grounded in the particular kind of master-slave relationship that emerged under conditions of chattel slavery in the US. In theorizing modern consciousness, Georg Hegel famously told us that the master becomes more dependent on the slave for his identity than vice versa, and rightfully has existential fears about the ending of that relationship. Friedrich Nietzsche wrote that those who believe themselves masters in conditions of modernity are acting from a position of impotence that they call morality. They rely not just on otherness, but on the evil other to have any concept of themselves as good. In other words, whiteness would not exist as morally righteous and civilized without the dangerousness of blackness against which to identify itself. Franz Fanon said the native in the wars of independence in Northern Africa during which Fanon wrote, was indeed a danger to European colonists and was a creation of the colonists. In the tradition of Hegel and Marx, Fanon showed how the colonizer created the conditions of its own violent end. So I bolded this because it's something I'm trying to think about and work out, but thinking about white supremacy in the United States is symptomatic of the political impotence of whiteness as such. White supremacy requires violence, institutionalized coercion, forcing black men by law to use bathrooms at the top of office buildings such that they literally have to put themselves in situations that are suspect from white perspectives. Whiteness cannot allow its other freedom or equality because it will literally disappear. The white supremacists in Charlottesville were not wrong to shout at their fears of being replaced, but it was, would have been more accurate from my perspective to say that their whiteness, not they themselves, will disappear because whiteness cannot function without being dominant. If its others become equal to it, it will disappear. The racial state rationalizes this fear through policy that over the decade come to appear colorblind, but remains informed by the same fears of the European masters of the early 19th century. When legal segregation ended and policy-driven segregation was somewhat eroded, the war on drugs and the war on crime replaced those forms of social and political control. White fear of blackness did not end because of, civil, because of the civil rights movement. Rather, as Michelle, Michelle Alexander famously tells us, it shape-shifted into the war on So pointing to how fearful and impotent white supremacy is in resorting to legalized and extra-legal violence as a means to contain its other can help us understand whiteness as a house of cards buttressed by the use of violence. This is a slightly different take on white fragility a coi a coined by Robin DiAngelo. That book, her book frames the question in terms of white people being scared, defensive, and sometimes violently angry when hearing about their racism. And I like that framing. But I want to radicalize it further and say that if those defending themselves against charges of racism, even without conscious awareness of their preferences, want to continue to enjoy the attendant privileges it brings, they have reason to be afraid. White fragility is grounded at resentiment, the deep disguise of impotence as moral superiority. Whiteness is a purely reactive identity. It requires the otherness of blackness to exist at all. Whiteness cannot persist if actual equality emerges as a reality, and it will have to be the first racial construction to go. Detaching from our whiteness does not mean detaching from ourselves. Nothing of value, I argue, will disappear. Plantation owners like Thomas Jefferson could not do this. The white citizens of Tulsa could not do this. In the post-Jim Crow era, white voters have not done it. We, uh, Carol Anderson in White Rage argues that fear of Obamacare inspired the election of Trump or points that out. Black people have been trying to prove themselves harmless for 400 years, yet fear of the imaginary wolf created by slavery continues to drive policy preferences. As the author Yag Ayasi said recently in an interview on Fresh Air, she learned in her early 20s that she could not outrun racism by chasing black respectability. 
Racial justice, in my view, is an aspiration that requires recognition of how deeply blackness is associated with dangerousness and recognition of the fantastical association, quality of that association. It is purely a figment of the European master colonizer imagination. It is sheer invention. Whiteness as a reactionary and purely historical construction, however, is a danger to us all, including those of us who identify as white. This recognition can be had by ceasing to be defensive about reconstructing our textbooks and curriculum to show that white fear and loathing is what, what white fear and loathing has wrought in the post-slavery era of lynching and community massacres, Jim Crow and mass incarceration. Putting these at the center of our analysis of racialized historical and cultural developments in the US may help begin to undo white supremacy as a fear and resentment based construction. So I offer this slide uh, with uh, Leisha, uh, uh, I just blanked on her name, um, a slide that was a photo taken by a reporter in the, after, in the aftermath of the Ferguson uprising and uh, because it just speaks so much to what I've been talking about in this, the, the posture of the two policemen, the posture of the woman and the entire scenario of the militarized police for, policing of Ferguson when that first came to our attention as a national public. Um, so in other presentations I've, I've asked people to get into breakout groups and just talk about how this photo reflects on what it is that I've argued here. Um, but in this case, I think we're just going to talk and not do breakout groups and we can use the photo or uh, I'm absolutely open to any kinds of discussion that you have. And I'll stop sharing now unless you want me to put up a particular slide when we're talking. Is that the best idea? That sounds good. I think that's great. This is excellent, by the way. I think this is, this should generate mountains of questions. I got some questions, but first, let's leave it to other people first. Let me open it up to anyone else. Again, remember, we're being recorded. So if you don't want to hear, have your voice recorded, you can always type into chat. Or if you don't mind, just go ahead and click on your computer. I'll leave it open to other people to ask questions first. I could get things started then. Uh, let me let me start with a comment. Uh, first of all, I'm just glad that someone's talking about whiteness. And we got a lot of great presentations that deal with a lot of different areas. We, you know, we're looking at racial justice from so many different angles. Uh, but whiteness itself oftentimes is not mentioned. And there are all sorts of questions about how we can improve race relations and improve living conditions for minorities. It's hard to talk about those without first talking about whiteness, which stands on top of all of that. So I'm glad that somebody's addressing this. You're not the last presenter who's going to talk about this, but I'm glad that we do have some people on the schedule who are, who are taking it on directly. And uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the moral support, the moral superiority, which Nietzsche was the one who said that that is uh, an impotent moral support, moral superiority. Um, do you see that that has evolved over time in the U.S.? Has it changed since the days that, you know, obviously he was writing from a European perspective, uh, but even across the ocean or over time, have you seen that evolving and changing? The, um, if you're, if we're asking, about strategies on the ground, you know, what it looks like for that dynamic to be perpetuated. Um, I would argue that we could look at the ways in which the structure and the, the way in which we use prisons now, for example, and the images of what uh, of the, in the fear and the, and the kind of loathing and the kind of um, ways in which we think about those persons who uh, 
live in in prisons is a reflection of this dynamic. I was thinking about um, Justice Scalia in his dissent in the Brown versus Plata case in California, which was about overcrowding. And he has this, you know, inimically, you know, Scalia-like quotation where he says that the outcome of the Supreme Court decision that essentially said that California would have to release from its straight prisons upwards of 46,000 people in order to reach a to reach a, a, a an over you know a 137.5 percentage rate of uh, use of their the use of their prisons they'd have to re release up to 46,000. His response was, <clears throat> "Yes, I can really see all of these very." Uh, highly, uh, these very buff, well-muscled uh, criminals coming out of those prisons and enjoying, uh, you know, fruits of this Supreme Court decision. And the very image of the, I don't have the sentence up in front of me, but the image that he produced was definitely that sort of fearful image of the large black muscled man. And it, it was so it's, it was almost, I have to say this, it was almost pornographic in its sort of fantasy life in that, in that decision. It's, it's striking. So there's something uh, about that that I think we need to go uh, deeper, and I think Nietzsche sort of helps us think about in terms of the um, sense of uh, the, the, the reality of the kind of um, impotent power of whiteness without that threat. And that's what's important about Nietzsche is that you, you don't have it without having that threat always already there. Does that help at all with that, that question? I'm sort of. Yeah, that, no, that was great. Um, I'm kind of like you. I, I was, you know, you're learning about Tulsa, and on the one hand, you're shocked by the event itself, but you're also shocked, like, why didn't I learn this in school, yeah. right? And that, you know, that it's almost like we have to work to maintain this uh, mentality or this threat it has to be it has to be uh, always perpetuated. And yeah, the descriptions often focus on physicality mm -hmm. and description of this hyper masculine entity. Uh, to try and promote this this sort of uh, this lurking threat. Now, I do have a, a typed question that I'm going to read to you. This is not my own question. Um, but one of, one of the participants says, hi, Renee. I grew up in Oklahoma City, and I was never taught about this event in school. It wasn't until college in an upper-level history course that I learned of the riots and the subsequent altering of the historical record literal holes in newspapers, apparently. Could you talk a little more about the historical record of the Tulsa race riots? What was intentionally altered and how historians piece together what happened? The best resource I have, I'm going to share my screen again. I have a list of um, resources. and I'm going to show you the one that I think is most helpful with that question. And it is. James Hirsch, Riot and Remembrance, the Tulsa Race War and its Legacy. So he's done a lot of that work. There was a, a witness uh, named Mary Tyler who wrote a sort of documentary uh, version of what happened during the riots. Uh, B.C. Franklin was an attorney in Greenwood who was extremely influential. In fact, he's the father of the very famous and renowned John Hope Franklin, who gave us some of the best anthologies of prison writing in the latter half of the 20th century. Uh, B.C. Franklin was an attorney in Greenwood, and he uh, wrote a 10-page memo that is about the riots that is on uh, line with the Smithsonian Institution that I have in these resources. Uh, there was a thesis written by a student in 1946, and the and Scott Ellsworth wrote Death in a Promised Land in 1982. And all of these resources are fairly 
quick reads. Uh, they're very historical, very descriptive uh, resources that you can look at to find more about, especially in James Hurst, more about the um, literal burying of this. One of the ways in which it was buried was that, you know, after atrocities, there's always a lot of discussion about the numbers of the dead, as if that then will clarify the or quantify the horror that happened somehow and, and make it either more real or less bad or, or more bad or something. And debates, the, the numbers of dead in Greenwood, the estimates range anywhere from an official Tulsa estimate of 36 to the current number that people use, and that's over 300. One of the reasons that that number is so unclear is that the mayor of Tulsa forbade and the chief of police and the sheriff and all the powers that be forbade funerals from happening inside the city limits of Tulsa. They said because churches were being used for relief purposes, but it was actually probably because they feared the kind of violence that they simply feared because they white Tulsa had engaged in this horrifying act. And so they were trying to manage, you know, the white people basically by not allowing funerals for those who were murdered in the riots to be held within the city limits. And so a lot, so there's no body count of the people who were killed. Uh, there was an effort that's described in Hirsch's book to uncover mass graves in the early 2000s that was then stymied by I think it was, I can't remember exactly what it was, time, but it was never completed. So every effort to really uncover more facts about this has been undermined by uh, bureaucracy, by uh, inertia, by just sheer you know, lack of political will on the part of the powers that be to carry it out. And the, the newspaper op-ed is one of the most obvious egregious example of the Tulsa Tribune for some reason, because it was a blatantly racist paper. I mean, the guy, I'm not really sure why this guy wanted to hide his participation in this or, or take that editorial out, but that was, that is just gone from the historical archive. Um, but people are pretty sure that it existed. And we know the power of newspapers at that point was different from today. I mean, the, the newspaper has power today. Back then it was, it was like a broadsheet that, that call people to action, basically. So, does that help? Uh, someone raised their hand. Go ahead, Christopher Martin. Yeah. Um, hi. Thanks, Renee. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, really exciting stuff. And I wanted to ask you uh, a little bit about Nietzsche and, and Hegel, because I always like them. Um, but specifically, there's a lot of uh, dualistic thinking in, in, in what you were talking about. And um, Hegel, for instance, talked about ultimately possibly overcoming the duality. Uh, Nietzsche maybe, maybe didn't either. But here's my question with respect to the duality and Nietzsche. Um, I think I know the answer, but I'm just curious. Is there an overman or woman person? in the story. So so is there a message in the story where we can see the the glimmer of a new attitude towards um, racial equality? I suppose I thought for a second that the sheriff in putting color aside for the sake of rule of law and stability might constitute a kind of overcoming of a duality. I, I think you're right, probably, maybe not, or very poorly. I, I don't know. But here's sort of my real question. One of the things that, that Nietzsche pushed is a lot of morality is, is grounded in fear and resentment. And these are very, um, let's call them superficial qualities. Uh, the same goes with white fragility. We're using our skin color to establish some kind of dominance. Um, Nietzsche got a lot of things wrong but he didn't get everything wrong. And some of the things I think he might've gotten right was this notion that the new morality should be something that stems from within. So that we should look from the power within us and see this power as the source, what should be the source of our moral codes and values. So when we think for instance about the Black Lives Matter movement, it's not the color of the skin, it's the life. And the life is something internal, 
the life is something that is a power. It is a, you know, as you used in your talk, a will to power. So I know this is over a long, complicated question, but sort of to, 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 to put a specific target on it, is there, in your way of thinking, room for an overcoming of uh, the dualities uh, to a more uh, internal, intrinsic power that grounds morality? Could we see this in the sheriff? Could we see this in the Black Lives Matter movement? Or is this just sort of foolish and it's always going to be um, uh, fear and resentment driving so-called moral notions? Josh, I think you just wrote, uh, Chris, I think you just wrote a really excellent paper or the start of one, like the introduction to one. That's not, yeah. Uh, based I'm, on. I hope you don't know this, but yeah. No, based on some of the ideas, because I just think that you, you did respond to your own question in the same way I think I would have. I don't think I have anything more to say on that, so I'd rather throw it out to other people and ask them to think about it, because the first person, that, the first figure that came to mind when you were talking was the woman in the photo. And when when you see her uh, when you see her testimonies about being there in Louisiana uh, and why she was there and what she was doing and what she was thinking at that moment, it reflects everything you just said about Black Lives Matter. That said, I don't want to romanticize anybody or anything in any final manner. I don't think I'm a believer in, you know, the idea that politics is a long, slow boring of hard boards, as, as our favorite Max Weber said, and that this is ongoing and temporary, that any figures that emerge like that are going to be, in some sense, temporary and contingent upon context and understanding and interpretation, and that heroizing or highlighting them as such could lead to more problems than solutions in some sense. But, but I don't disagree that, you know, the sheriff could be the the sheriff in defending the rule of law the rule of law is already imminently racialized however so i don't i don't think i'd place him in that position um and he was also implicated in just trying to keep the peace right in the worst possible way um he did also say that dick Rau you know when he was confronted by the by the black people of greenwood to re they wanted him to release dick Rowell into their custody that night and he said, no, we can't do that because only a judge can do that. And uh, I think rightfully so. The, it, and that's, that did satisfy the, the, the black men that were at the courthouse. And it was all men as far as we know. Um, and they did begin to leave. And it was only in this incident where a white man asked one of the, said to one of the black men, what are you doing with that? gun n-word and the black man said i'm going to use it if i have to and then the white man tried to take it from him and uh and a shot was fired and that's what triggered in the immediate sense the the rioting um, but but i just i just think that you just elaborated on your own question beautifully i've got nothing more to say about that at this point do other people i mean i'd love to open it up to other folks I'm not super well versed in Nietzsche. Uh, my understanding of the Ubermensch is that is that you know there's there's a person who personifies uh, a, a better humanity, and in this case there may not be that one person, but we might find instances and examples from a variety of people and a variety of walks of life. But I if if you know if it relates to finding a sense of hope out of all this. I do find some new hope in the new generation myself personally. I, when I talk to my students and I compare the things that they say to what I heard when I was a college student, I think students today are much generally much more aware and better, uh, but more open-minded, more aware. That they're in a much better position about race relations, about gender than my cohort was back when I was in college, which admittedly was a very long time ago. And Chris, they may, that may not be a fair assessment of Nietzsche. I'm not a philosopher. Uh, there's a million assessments of Nietzsche, so I... <laughs> <laughs>
But I suppose I I feel like three to three and a half days of the week, I can find a kind of naive optimism that, uh, you know, I, uh, again, I thought today's talk was great and I was not aware of the Tulsa massacre. Um, but one of the things I was thinking was as uh, racially polarized as we are today, I want to say we don't see, I think it's fair to say, we don't see this kind of, this degree of violence. Now that just might just be social mores having conditioned us against it uh, and no other reason. Um, but I'm sort of hopeful that there is a gradual recognition of uh, inherent worth um, that, that that may be spreading slowly so that gradually, you know, these, these dualities would be lessened um, perhaps. Uh, and so that we wouldn't have quite these, you know, racial problems uh, and various other aspects of this issue. I just sort of feel like the other three, three and a half days a week, that's maybe naive. Dualism is here to stay. Uh, resentment and fear are going to be the driving factors. And um, the best we can do is try and educate ourselves and others. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's at best a question. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Joey, yeah, did you want to actually, Yeah, D Dr. Gamble. Hi, thank you so much, Renee. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, that was, this it, was good to hear you. Um, yes, I'm, oh, yeah, sorry. I, I, I don't have my camera on. But um, okay. I, I, I have, a, a, I think, a related question, but that cuts a slightly different way. So I'm really interested in the way that you, you, you started the talk by saying, um, or somewhere near the beginning of the talk, saying, you know, I do not disaggregate whiteness to the level of the individual, right? Which is a pretty standard sort of like structural account of whiteness, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. But then the move to thinking about fear and resentment, right? That move to affect seems to suggest mm -hmm. one of two things maybe, right? So you say that white supremacy, right? I think you say is, is, is a structure of fear and resentment, right? So I wondered if you were making an analytic distinction between whiteness and white supremacy. Um, and also what the what the relationship between whiteness as a political structure and those political affects, um, what is that relationship? How are you imagining and theorizing it? Because um, this is a question that I also think through all the time and I don't know how to resolve it. <laughs> oh my God. Well, yeah, in part, that's why I'm, I'm thinking through Weber and Nietzsche's two sort of primary sources, theoretical sources here, is that I think that they give us the opportunity to start working on that intersection uh, between affect and structure um, and thinking about it in the context of a um, kind of commu communal or, or group oriented uh, sensibility or, or you know, um, cultural sensibility and structural sensibility rather than something that we simply accuse someone of for being white as an individual. Um, I think we, you know, we sort of swim in the water of whiteness and uh, end of white supremacy to some degree. So no, I completely agree, and I and I think what I what I'm working on is to articulate that more clearly. And that's that that question that you're raising is precisely why I'm looking at these two particular um, frameworks or thinkers to to try to get at that relationship between affect and structure. It's a brilliant question, um, and if there's an analog difference between white supremacy and whiteness I I need to think about that that's a really good question um, I wanted to go back just to for a minute to what Chris was saying about whether or not there's a sort of decline in violence I'm teaching a course on the called the politics of violence in law and society and one of our that's one of our that is sort of our framing question is 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 what we're living in a form of progress is there a sort of decline of violence but I was listening to um, a lecture by Carol Anderson who wrote White Rage and she was describing what motivated her in I think it was 1998 when Amadou Diallo was shot 41 times in the foyer of his Manhattan apartment building and um, I think the other thing that got me thinking about this, this way is the level of, I mean, seven shots fired against, um, I'm sorry, when I'm in the middle of a presentation, names just escape me unless they're in front of me. Uh, 
41 shots fired, and, and the, 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 the number of gunshots and the ways in which police react to black men who threaten them or appear to threaten them, the number of gunshots uh, that took um, Breonna Taylor out, the number of, I mean, I just, there's something about that that I think we need to capture and grab onto in terms of our analysis of these events rather than thinking there's less violence or the, the ways in which uh, people who are incarcerated are understood to be imminently, just because they are incarcerated and there are, you know, 1.2 million in prisons and then about 700,000 in other uh, relationships through the criminal justice system, the ways in which people are understood to be dangerous simply by virtue of their connection with the criminal justice system and the kinds of violence that the length of sentencing we have longer sentences in the United States and parole boards do not release people in Ohio because, and this is explicit in all the reports from the parole board, because of the crime they committed, they remain dangerous. They cannot rehabilitate themselves. And so that kind of, that level of fear and loathing, I think, is implicated in all the ways in which mass incarceration is perpetuated as a form of violence in itself and also implicated in the ways in which policing and the anxiety of police black or white policemen around black people is uh implicated in in levels of violence that i just find really remarkable um so i i don't think about it in linear terms or terms of more or less violence i'm thinking about violence itself and what it looks like when it happens in the context of uh, white people and black people. And I'm really focusing on chattel slavery and on black people because I really think that that's a, a different kind of fulcrum of conflict and tension and violence than other ethnicities and other kinds of questions. I just think it's significantly different and requires its own level of analysis. Sorry, they're mowing the lawn right outside my building. So That's okay. But we are going over time. And so I'm going to stop the recording now. Now, Dr. Heberly, first of all, I want to say thanks to everyone for attending and thank you again, Dr. Heberly. And Dr. Heberly offered to stick around if anybody wants to stick around and ask further questions. So we'll stay on for a couple minutes, but- I thought we were going till 12.30. Oh, we go to 12.15, actually. Oh, okay. It's just an hour, yeah. But we can, well, um, I'll end the recording and then we'll, yeah. we'll stick around and if people uh, have more questions. I might have a couple more questions myself. So thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your attendance. Hope you can make it Friday as well for uh, Dr. Adjilor. We'll see you all then. Thank you. And don't